Hi, uh, my name is Andrei Levchenko. I'm from Yale University and I'm gonna talk to you about our research today. But the first thing I want to say is that it's a great pleasure to give a talk at this meeting. Um, this is the second year I'm doing IC Biomed and this is a very exciting conference. And so um, I'd like to believe that what we are working on will be of interest to people. I would like to start my presentation today by reminding of this a simple classical genetics or view of how genotype and phenotype may be related to each other. You probably have seen it before. The genotype, the collection of um, genes in the genome, um, is something that, of course, we understand very well uh, and have uh, we've seen huge advances over the last couple of decades of trying to sort of characterize and understand it very well. Um, but that, of course, has to be translated into something that cells do uh, or the way they look, the way they behave, uh, whether they move or divide or die or differentiate. And uh, classically within genetics, the idea of this one-to-one -one mapping between genotype and phenotype means that all of the information to understand phenotype you can find in the in a cell's genotype. Of course, the reality is uh, is not as simple as that uh, because there are multiple inputs, uh, multiple environmental uh, perturbations of all of that that would mean that uh, there's a whole series of different phenotypic states that cells can be in. Um, of course, it can be a sort of a normal way of the cells respond to the environment um, in normal genotypic kind of conditions or uh, particularly for disease states, you can have completely different phenotypic outcomes uh, based on the changes in, in genotype cells will interpret environmental inputs or drug inputs in different ways. And this can be actually quite uh, convenient for, for us because it would mean that one can develop uh, drugs that would hopefully target the disease state but not normal state. Uh, so uh, what it would mean is that if there is a therapeutic intervention, for example, and the input is, is uh, a drug that, for example, can kill the cells with some probability, uh, this could happen differently for normal phenotypes um, versus disease phenotypes and this divergence between the responses of normal cells and disease cells to the input, in this case again could be a drug, uh, is what we would term the therapeutic window. This is a bit more sort of more conventional view of how therapeutic windows are defined. You can see that um, yeah, this diagram basically shows the effect of a drug at different doses. And uh, within a certain range of drug doses, there is a, quite a bit of a divergence of how normal and disease cells will respond to the drug. Uh, much greater fraction of normal cells will survive uh, these doses within this window. Uh, versus the disease cells, although at very low concentrations or very high concentrations of a drug, you can see that either no cells are affected or both normal and diseased cells are affected. So we'd like to really understand how we can find predictively, kind of uh, uh, find such windows as we develop drugs. Um, again, uh, we are not so good at characterizing phenotypes, um, com especially compared to our progress with the genotype genetic analysis. Uh, phenotypic states are much more nebul nebulous. We kind of try to develop different assays, but you know, there's really no standardized way of, of thinking even about this. And so what I would like to propose is that uh, the, the good way of thinking about this is to think to focus on this dedicated cellular or molecular level programs uh, that we would term execution modules that are fully dedicated uh, to execution of some phenotypic outcome. For example, it could be, as we'll discuss today, uh, cell death or uh, controlled cell death, uh, apoptosis. Could be, uh, in some other examples, it could be differentiation programs or uh, cell proliferation programs or some other programs. And uh, as long as we understand them, uh, I will argue we can actually uh, understand the phenotypes. 
So this is just an, uh, a, a nice and very famous, actually, diagram showing how this uh, programs within a cell, shown here within squares, um, such as apoptosis or cell cycle, um, can be regulated by specifically some dedicated programs within the cells. But they're also linked to the environmental inputs through this massive uh, network of signaling pathways that would uh, uh, sort of condition on uh, condition how the cells behave or what they do and how the sp specific programs are executed, condition that on the environmental inputs. So let's talk a little bit about this control of apoptosis and what we would mean by execution module and how we would quantitatively analyze it. And so here, of course, the apoptosis program is very complex, but uh, it can actually be uh, relatively simply understood by focusing on the BCL family of pro and anti-apoptotic proteins. And this family works in a relatively simple way where uh, uh, some members of this family are anti-apoptotic, such as BCL2, some of them are pro-apoptotic, such as Bax, and they can form homodimers that are active. And so if you have a lot more BCL2, for example, than Bax, there's going to be a lot of homodimers where BCL2 will bind to BCL2, and they'll be very actively defending the cells from apoptosis. On the other hand, if you have overabundance of Bax proteins, they'll form homodimers, active homodimers, and they'll be promoting apoptosis. Now, if the abundances are comparable, then BCL2 and Bax can also bind to each other, and this creates an inactive um, heterodimer, and this will happen with very high probability, and that would mean that if the abundances are similar, cells would be sort of sitting on the fence in res with respect to whether they would commit death or uh, they will stay alive. So this uh, boundary sort of can be seen even in uh, this plane, uh, kind of phenotypic plane, where um, on the axis on the right you can see the uh, x-axis is pro-apoptotic proteins such as Bax, uh, y-axis anti-apoptotic proteins, concentration of anti-apoptotic proteins such as BCL2, and uh, depending on where, uh, you know, what relative abundances of these proteins one might have, cells would be in different parts on this plane, but there's going to be also this boundary uh, that would separate uh, death outcome from survival. So, you know, a given cell, typical cell, for example, or maybe something that you would use to characterize the whole population could be, let's say, in such a position on this plane, and that would mean that uh, there's going to be a survival because there's a abundance of anti-apoptotic, relative abundance of anti-apoptotic versus pro-apoptotic proteins. Now, the signals that you can have or drugs that one can develop essentially will change the relative abundance of these proteins and may push, so to speak, the cells closer to the boundary uh, between cell survival and cell death. And that's what we would like to sort of uh, understand how this may happen in specific cases so that as we develop drugs, we can tell us a little bit more how the drugs will work. One thing we should remember, of course, is that all these single-cell studies tell us, and this is just a couple of examples, that um, in reality, uh, you know, not all the cells, in fact, none of the cells will have exactly the same combination of different proteins. There's this whole distribution um, that can be quite noisy of different combinations of different proteins in a cell. And what it truly means is that if you'd like to think about populations of cells, you're thinking about a cloud of uh, different combinations of even pro and anti-apoptotic proteins, kind of like a big blob here, cloud di distribution. And uh, the drug effect here would uh, move again or change the relative abundances uh, for all the different cells within the distribution. You can see here what it means is that uh, only a fraction of cells may cross the boundary, and a fraction of cells may not cross the boundary as the drug is applied. So there could be a fractional cell death in response to the drug. Now, uh, so this type of mapping of uh, cell populations onto the phenotypic planes can really then start telling us very quantitatively what the effects for the drugs may be. Now let's take a look at how we can use that to define therapeutic window for this particular example of loss of imprinting. It's an epigenetic change. 
of this insulin like growth factor 2 normally there's just uh, one copy in humans inherited from one of the parents and not the other parent um, and uh, on occasion this kind of single copy uh, result of uh, what's known as the imprinting parent specific imprinting uh, can be lost and so instead of a single copy there are two copies that are activated and you can see that this could lead to much larger animals uh, but in humans, if it happens, it can lead to an increase in the propensity for cancer formation, predisposition to cancer. And so it would be wonderful to eliminate cells in which such loss of imprinting may happen. Um, and it turns out that there are drugs that affect the uh, um, IGF-2 uh, 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 receptors for IGF-2, called IGF-1 receptor, actually, um, the kinase activity of this receptor. Uh, for which there's this very nice therapeutic window that exists um, and uh, we'd like to really understand where this window comes from. Um, now, you know, basic characteristics of the cells are interesting to quickly uh, look at and some of them are shown here. So again, you can see that IGF-2 uh, is uh, overexpressed now within this loss of imprinting cells in the mRNA level and the, also in the protein level. Uh, it actually leads to uh, an increase even in the receptor level in the cells, so both ligand and receptor are upregulated. The cells proliferate more, and that uh, underlies this increase in the size of the animals, but also increase in the, um, in the specific organs and propensity to form cancer. And uh, on the very right of this diagram, you can see again this effect of the drug that magically somehow targets these cells, but not cells that are not affected by, by this change. So again, there is this therapeutic window that we have. So um, uh, one interesting result here is that if you start analyzing the cells, what you see is that um, this receptor uh, that I mentioned before can trigger uh, two canonical signaling pathways. But what happens is as the cells acquire this uh, loss of imprinting, um, the relative balance of the signaling pathways changes. Um, and uh, what you see is that in uh, this LOI cells, uh, the uh, activity of AKT pathway goes down, the activity of the Kirk pathway goes up. Now, that seems like a curious feature, but it actually is quite consequential for what we're discussing and the understanding of the therapeutic window, <clears throat> because you can see that not only these pathways now are differentially balanced <clears throat> within the signaling network, but also they are directly affecting the PCL family proteins you know, with AKT affecting PCL2 and ERK affecting BACs. And so what happens is that not only there's a change in the balance of signaling pathway, but also in the relative abundances of BCL2 and Pax proteins. And you can see this in this quantified way for this analysis. Now, uh, the way it happens is uh, to, you can even quantitatively sort of predict how much of a change in the balance you will have. And that depends on the uh, integrated uh, over time um, uh, activity of this uh, ERK and AGT pathways. And again, quantitatively, you can be very, very precise about predicting how this may change the balance of BACs and BCL. So now we can sort of go back to this uh, map, this phenotypic map, and try to understand where the wild type cells are and where the uh, LOI cells are in this diagram. And this is what we have. Uh, so now we're on the left, you can see the actual measurements uh, of uh, BCL2 and BACs in both wild type and LOI cells, and how this now gets mapped on the right onto this phenotypic plane. And you find that this whole distribution of LOI cells is much closer to this boundary between the cell survival and cell death versus the wild type cells. And that immediately tells us that potentially it could be easier to kill the cells by sort of a well-designed way where both of the populations potentially could be um, 
moved, but uh, since LOI cells are already closer to the boundary, they can be potentially killed a little bit easier. So to understand this a little bit more, again, let's take a look at this specific perturbation that we uh, showed before, for which there's a very nice therapeutic window, this uh, so-called NVP drug, and uh, different drug concentrations affect, uh, primarily affect the receptor and the balance of signaling pathways downstream of the receptor, uh, AKT and ERK as shown here. And uh, knowing that and knowing how the change in AKT, for example, translates to change in BCL2, we can um, predict how the input of the drug will change the balance of these different pathways as well as the balance of BCL2 and BACs. So essentially this prediction is shown schematically here. You can see that the drug, when it acts, it actually pushes both of the populations, uh, depending on the dose, towards the death boundary. And now you can see that you can start selectively killing LOI cells, but not wild type cells. And the model uh, mathematically predicts, now can predict uh, where this therapeutic window is going to be uh, uh, occurring. Uh, for example, as uh, this signaling pathways are inhibited. And from that, you can predict the survival and compare the diagram, predicted diagram, to the actual um, experimentally observed window. And you find that, that there's a pretty good agreement between the prediction and the observation. So essentially, this mapping of the populations onto these phenotypic diagrams can be quite predictive about the, the, the therapeutic window and give us a nice tool to think about these phenoty phenotypes in a very quantitative way, in a way where we can actually predict both for the wild type cells and affected cells, in this case LOI cells, how the different drugs may affect them. So let me try to conclude here by sort of recapping a couple of uh, important things. Um, again, uh, we talked a little bit about the phenotype of apoptosis and how we can describe it very generally through this kind of uh, diagram or phenotypic map. Um, and in principle, uh, cells could be anywhere on this diagram, depending on their relative abundance of pro and apoptotic, anti-apoptotic proteins. But uh, for given examples that we could have, you can very precisely map both wild type cells and affected cells onto these diagrams, as well as understand how the drugs, as you develop them, can affect the relative distributions of these proteins and therefore mapping of the uh, populations onto those diagrams. And in turn, this predicts the uh, therapeutic windows. Uh, that could be then very, very uh, useful in the, in, in the drug design. Um, and so um, frequently our drugs are uh, not targeting specifically, as in this case would be kind of separately BCL2 or BAX uh, proteins. They target signaling pathways frequently or receptors. Um, and therefore, uh, this uh, kind of mapping that we're talking about here is really uh, from how the signaling pathways are affected by the drugs and how this can lead to a change in the phenotype-specific uh, proteins, in this case BCL2 and BAGs. Uh, so this transitions, this mappings happen within uh, this network view that can be also very precisely modeled and understood. So uh, this all of this analysis does take into account the variability within the cell populations, and it's a very, very important aspect of what we need to take into account. And those variabilities, this sort of distributions of um, uh, different proteins within the cells, this phenotypic sort of plasticity of the cells, um, uh, is now much more accessible from the single cell studies. So combining that, combining our modeling efforts and uh, this sort of paradigm that is proposed here could be super useful in the design of the um, therapeutic perturbations in different settings, for example. Thank you very much, and 
um, again, thank you for uh, to the organizers uh, for providing me with an opportunity to tell you the story.